Hey, everyone. Um, so uh, I am Reza Rogni, uh, Google Cloud uh, developer for um, uh, uh, Dataflow and uh, Apache Beam. Uh, and with me, I have Robert. Hi, Robert Crow, uh, developer engineer for TFX and TensorFlow. Great. And um, uh, today's talk is going to be on uh, doing inferences with a model that we've taught to do its five times table. So it's a learner model. And uh, we're going to be making use of a utility called uh, run inference, which comes from uh, TFX. Uh, and uh, uh, if we can go to the agenda slide there, please. Thank you. Great. So. Uh, in the talk today, uh, Robert will actually cover a little bit of a broad strokes of the TFX and ML ops and get into where run inference sits within that framework. Um, and then in the next stage, uh, I will actually make use of run inference uh, to do some inferences within an Apache Beam pipeline using a simple model uh, that we put together, which is uh, has learned its five times table. Um, after that, we'll be doing a little bit on pre and post processing. So the, th the work that needs to be done in getting uh, the data ready to send to the model and the things that you would do after the, the model. Um, beyond that, we get into some more advanced use cases where uh, while it might be an advanced use case, the actual coding for most of this uh, lab is super trivial thanks to, to the run inference utility. Um, and in that uh, uh, final set sections, we will be making use of the ability with Beam to create uh, really complex DAGs as a directed acyclic graphs of executions. This will be with branching and doing sequential uh, 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 models um, and all of this. And, and in that phase, Robert will also describe to us why that's useful in, in the uh, ML world. And at the end, if we uh, have time, we'll quickly cover uh, the, the fact that the data flow runner now supports GPUs which is obviously very useful for, for large uh, models. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Robert to, to run us through the, the TensorFlow side of things. All right, thanks, Reza. Um, so we're going to be talking a little bit about TFX and run inference and sort of the genesis of run inference and, and how it came about and, and why we have it before we get into some really interesting usage of it. So um, if you look at machine learning, it naturally falls into a series of tasks. So when you're training a model, uh, you first ingest some, some training data. Um, you validate that data because uh, you want to make sure that there aren't issues with it before you get too far down the line. Um, also, it helps to, to understand your data and make sure that you, know, you understand what uh, like the different domains of categorical variables are and so forth. Then you're going to do some feature engineering to transform that data into a form that really helps concentrate the predictive signal and, and helps the model learn. Then you're going to actually train the model, um, and then you're going to validate the, the results of the model. And at that point, you'll probably compare it to other models that you've done, like a baseline model or the model that you currently have in production. And then assuming that it, it uh, performs well, then you're going to push it to some, some uh, uh, deployment uh, uh, infrastructure where you're going to actually serve requests. Well, TFX follows that same pattern of, of tasks, and we do it in a couple of different ways. We have libraries that are open source, and you can use the libraries by themselves, and they each focus on a particular part of that, that series of tasks. So TensorFlow data validation and transform and, and model analysis and so forth. That's the, the row in, in the middle there. In orange, you see components that make up a TFX pipeline. So in a way, if you think of it in beam terms, it, those might map to P transforms, where um, you're, you're actually moving through the pipeline. And those, those components uh, leverage the... Um, the libraries uh, to do different parts of, of that series of tasks. But I want to emphasize that this is just the starter set of components. You can uh, also create your own components or go and grab one of the community components that have been uh, developed by the ML community. So um, that's what a TFX pipeline means. Portability is a big part of, of the TFX design philosophy. We want TFX to run really just about anywhere. And we'll talk about why that's important. 
That means running in different execution environments, like uh, just you know on the web in a web browser, uh, in a collab, um, or on your laptop, which I, I do all the time when I'm uh, developing pipelines, or in a containerized environment in Kubernetes, or in a managed environment in Vertex AI. So along with that, we have orchestrators. And as you might imagine, we have a series of different orchestrators that TFX is portable among, including just plain Python or Apache Airflow or Kubeflow. Or I should probably add Vertex AI in that as well because it actually does act as an orchestrator. And then we have uh, distributed processing because TFX is designed to handle large workloads, large compute resources. We do distributed processing on you know, um, distributed clusters using something called Apache Beam. You might have heard of it. And that includes being able to run with the, the direct runner on my laptop um, or, of course, in things like Spark and Flink and Cloud Dataflow. So why, why is that important to us? Well, basically because we want to meet the user's needs instead of requiring them to meet our needs. We don't want to specify a, you know, a rigid framework that they have to work in. We want to be flexible and allow them to work in different execution environments, using different orchestrators, different distributed processing frameworks, again, Apache Beam, um, different languages. Uh, to some extent, we, we can talk about that. A, uh, well, actually, I don't think we talk about that too much in this in this talk, but um, there's there's ways to do that, um, and that's important because you may have different teams um, that are working in different places on different things, and they've set up different infrastructure, or you just have people who are moving around. You have people who want to work on their laptop while they ride the train, and then when they get to the office, they they might want to, you know, run a, a big job on a on a, a data flow cluster or what have you. You may have done acquisitions, so you have different business units that are, you know, have already set up different infra and so forth. You want to be able to take those pipelines and easily move them among all those different environments without a lot of changes. And, and TFX allows you to do that because of the portability. So this is the kind of the hello world of TFX. You'll recognize those, uh, those uh, components in orange. Those are a training pipeline. Those are used to train a model and the, the, the input is a training data set and the output is a trained model. And again, this is just where you start. You can add and change this in myriad ways. Um, in green, that's an inference pipeline. So that is where you're gonna use TFX to run inference, batch inference, against uh, data that you have that you want to generate results from. So to do that, we first ingest unlabeled data, and then we use a component called bulk inference, which takes a trained model and runs inference. Hmm, how are we going to do that? Well, TFX likes to use distributed processing on, on uh, clusters, so we use Apache Beam to do that. Hmm. Well, maybe what we can do, and this is this is what the bulk infer looks like. Um, you can see that it gets a, an, an input from uh, the trainer component here and a validation outcome and then the the uh, the unlabeled data and it uses beam to do its inference. So this is what the signature looks like and uh, some of the options. But the important bit here, especially for this talk, is that beam uses a, a P transform called run inference. Um, it runs that uh, those that data processing on beam pipeline, so it wants to do that with inference as well. Um, inference is actually included in the TensorFlow uh, TFX uh, BSL or or um, uh, I think it's base standard library. Um, that's you can find that on GitHub. It's an it's an open source uh, project. Um, and run inference can also be used just in pure Beam. You don't have to use it with TFX. Because it's a P transform, you can just plug it into a Beam pipeline, which opens up some interesting possibilities. Um, so you can use a Beam pipeline with no TFX. You can also use it inside TFX, of course, and do interesting things in custom components that you might write. 
So a model at its heart is a function. And this is, is just about the simplest function you can imagine. It's, it's a linear function. And you give it one input, x, and you get one output, y. So in this case, we're doing uh, x times 5. So uh, it's, uh, you know, if x is 10, then, then 5 is, or y is 50. You can also think of, of a, a model, however, or a function for that matter, as a transformation. You're taking input, in this case x, and you're transforming that somehow and getting an output. So you can kind of look at a, a model in two different ways, but a model is exceptionally powerful. So you can imagine trying to do things like this with just like a, a P transform that you might write, but in, in a model, we, we can you know, pull a lot of these models off the shelf or there's well-developed uh, techniques for, for creating these models. So speech to text, for example, imagine trying to write that or text to customer sentiment or recognizing objects and images, including looking for manufacturing defects or predicting, predicting failures in, in, in equipment from time series data or selecting products that a customer uh, might want. Imagine trying to do all that just in a P transform without a model, but with a model, these things become very possible. So here's our, our basic model to start with. This is our linear function model. Uh, and it's very simple. We have one input layer. We have one output layer. with a, It's a dense neural network with one neuron. <laughs> and we train the model and, and compile it. And then the summary just prints out uh, just a, a summary of the model. All right, and um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Reza. Thank you very much, uh, Robert, that was very helpful. Um, uh, uh, to be on my screen, please, uh, for the admin. Um, so uh, in terms of run inference, there is this utility that uh, TFX has, has provided for us. Um, wanted to address sort of why we would use it rather than just doing this by hand. And what do we mean by doing it by hand? Well, with Beam, we can write do funds. And given a model that's been saved uh, uh, after training, we can call predictions on it within the do fun. Um, pretty straightforward, you know, very uh, a small amount of code to just do that specific piece. Why make use of run inference? Well, the key here is productionization. So um, if we were doing that thing by hand ourselves, very quickly after uh, getting our basic predict going and we want to start turning into a production environment, we need to start thinking about making it do things efficiently. For example, batching its inputs and sending batches of uh, predictions to the model because that would be more efficient. Um, well, the nice thing for us is that run inference already takes care of that for us. There's no technical debt here in, in trying to build this ourselves. Um, in terms of uh, if there are multiple parts of the organization that are talking to each other, the output from run inference is already been uh, nicely specified in what is a predict log, which is a proto. So it's a well understood output that we are getting from the inference that we can pass on to other transforms. And this would also be true if you were making use of it from uh, uh, different environments. Key forwarding, and we'll actually cover this in, in, in the code. Um, a simple thing here, but, but very key to, to um, pardon the pun, uh, to what we need to do. Imagine you have an image. Well, the data for the image is what you're sending to the model, but the name of the image is the metadata that we want associated with it, and we need that metadata in the next phases when we do our post-processing. Uh, or for uh, as another example, imagine we have data from an IoT device. So we send the data to the prediction, but we need the reference to the IoT device's ID to know what that prediction, which, which device that prediction belongs to. Uh, again, run inference just takes care of this for us with very little effort from our side. Um, run inference also supports both remote and local mode. By this, we mean in remote mode, you can actually pass it an endpoint on Google Cloud. Um, I, I believe Robert already mentioned Vertex AI. Um, and there, the prediction is run against a model that you've deployed there. Um, so in remote mode, um, uh, all we need to do is specify the URI, and we are done. 
However, we may also want to run uh, the model in local mode. This may be during testing, during other uh, circumstances. And by local mode, all we need to do is give run inference a location where the model file lives, and it will load that model in uh, to the beam pipeline and run the inferences locally. In terms of local mode, another thing that it does that we would have to do if we were building this all from scratch is that it will load the model. If you're familiar with the Python SDK from ABM, um, the shared.py uh, utility, uh, it makes use of that to actually load the model in memory so that within a single harness, any threads that are making use of the model only need to reference one, one model in memory. Um, so again, these are all optimizations that run inference does for us that we will no longer have to do if we were going to write our own prediction do fun. Um, and of course, any enhances and features that come uh, in the future, we automatically get for free as we move up through, through the versions. Um, so in terms of run inference, it, it is a transform that we can plug in as we do any other transform within our graph of computation, our directed cyclic graph of computation that we build using Apache Beam. So we can plug that in. In local mode, as we mentioned, it needs to pull a model file from a location. We need that location to be universally accessible to all of the workers. And in this case, and for the demo, we make use of Google Cloud Storage, Google's object store, to store the model. And when uh, the, the Beam pipeline spins up, it pulls that model down, and it gets everything ready, uh, ready for uh, processing of elements, whether that's in batch or stream mode. Now, a little bit on this, it, we have tried, even though we're making a use of a very toy model, um, as we go through this, we try and make the, the, the pipeline more and more uh, like a production pipeline. Uh, and uh, you, you'll be happy to note that with the exception of something we're going to talk about in a second, which is uh, TensorFlow signatures, everything is super straightforward. And the amount of code written is very small, as, you, as you'll see in a moment. Um, so uh, uh, in terms of the things that we're doing, obviously, pre-processing is going to happen within the Beam pipeline. Now, pre-processing could be as simple as reading information from a file and passing it to the model, or reading information from a data warehouse, doing some uh, pre-processing on that data to pass it into the model, for example, shaping it, or even much more sophisticated pre-processing pieces. For example, you could be pulling data from multiple sources, denormalizing all of that into a single piece of information, which you then do some feature extraction on, for example, some aggregations, et cetera, before you pass that into the model. So all of that possibility becomes available. And the way that run inference works is once you've got that data ready, it will pass that data to the first layer of the model. So going back to the, 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 the TensorFlow side from Robert, um, we have this input layer. This input layer is of shape one, so a single uh, piece. Um, and it's currently taking in a, a TensorFlow float, a float 32. So this is what the model is expecting. But as we are moving, uh, we're trying to get this to be more productionized. What we did was when we trained the model, we used TF example uh, to serialize our data. So TF example, for those who may not be familiar, very commonly used serialization within TensorFlow. Um, those TF example files, both for our inference test and, and for our, our uh, model building, was stored in what are known as TF records. So that's just a container that hosts these uh, serialized TF examples. So what we want we do is we read uh, these TF examples, which is what you would do much much more likely to do in the production environment. Um, TensorFlow ex, uh, TensorFlow extended pipelines will often use TF example uh, throughout, and uh, we read these TF examples and send these serialized uh, TF examples to run inference, which will pass it to the model. Now, those TF examples are serialized as string at the moment. Um, as we recall, on the input layer, that's expecting a float. How do we convert between the two? Well, we can use, and this is an advanced feature of TensorFlow, as, and, and, and I'll pass to Robert in a moment. But basically, with uh, uh, TensorFlow serving signatures, you can apply a function to the model, uh, to the data coming to the model, before that first layer. And uh, I'll show you that in code, what that looks like. Um, it's probably the most complicated bit of the whole whole demo, actually, that, that small bit of code. But um, uh, Robert, uh, serving signatures of other uses, and, and I thought for the audience, it'd be useful uh, to hear some of that. Maybe you could cover uh, a few of those. So a serving signature is very much like a method signature. So it, it tells you what the, the model expects. 
and how you can query the model. You can actually, though, in the case of a serving signature, you can have multiple signatures to be able to query the model in different ways. Um, so uh, when you just train a model without specifying a particular signature, there's a default. Um, but uh, if you, for more advanced usages, you can specify your own uh, custom signatures, and, and that uh, will give you more flexibility in, in some situations. So it just depends on how advanced uh, your usage of the model is. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to go over to a notebook and hope the demo gods are with us. Um, please note uh, all of the code, uh, yep, pretty much all of the code exactly as is that I'll be showing you is available in, in this blog that we've highlighted here, the using TFX uh, inference with Dataflow. So all of the code is there. You can copy into your own notebook and, and run through the example. Um, with that, I'm going to switch over to my notebook, which is a notebook that I've set up on the, the Dataflow service. So from Dataflow service, you can create your own notebooks that have all the environment and everything uh, uh, available. Um, I am going to run through a little bit of this. Uh, so um, let me just uh, run pit free. So the version of uh, Apache Beam we've got running on here is 2.31. Um, I have hidden quite a few of the, 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 the cells that are to do with model building, et cetera. Uh, just to, to, to clean and highlight the things that we wanted to show. Um, so in terms of the model itself, this is that model. As you'll note, this is currently using that float32 as its input layer. Um, there is a building of the model. I won't run that now. That's been run before. Uh, but we, we run this simple linear model. And then the next step is we do a prediction. So um, I'm going to try and predict uh, the, the, the results of sending in these inputs, so the number 20, 40, 60, and 90. These are going to be sent to the model. And as I said, if we are hand building inference within a do fund, this is the kind of thing that you would do, but then you don't get all of the benefits that we're going to get from, from using run inference. So let me just run this as is, just to see how our little uh, model is doing. So our little learner has not done too bad on its five times table. It's It's got a, a little bit of rounding, but it seems to have learned the, uh, okay. In, in fact, the data that we've sent it is the number between zero and, and, and 100. So that's what it's learned. Um, so next, now let's let's add the signature, and this is probably the, the most complex bit of the code that we will do. Um, and for this signature, we have a serving function, serving TF examples function. It takes a serialized TF example as string, and using TensorFlow uh, uh, IO parse example, it outputs uh, the features that we then make use of in the model. This is then wrapped up in uh, the signature, so serving default in the dictionary here, and we save the model. So the, the saving of the model is now done. It saves the model, that linear uh, model that, that, that Rob talked about. Um, it, it's been trained, so it's saving that learned model along with any signatures. So here, the signature that we're sending is this serving default. Something that I found very useful, so uh, when you get someone like Robert giving you a model that you want to use and, and me as a data engineer want to uh, look into, I found save model CLI particularly useful because uh, when we run this, it actually looks into the model file and outputs information from, from there, which can be very helpful. Um, in particular, uh, there's a lot of information here. I'm just going to look at the signature definition. So we have our serving default, and if you'll notice, the type is... Uh, a DT string. So now we're passing in a string to this model, um, which is the serialized uh, uh, TF example, and it's going to output. Now we're going to get to some really complicated code. Of course, I'm joking. Um, it is very straightforward with the run inference to make use of the model itself. So here we have uh, the Beam uh, pipeline, uh, which I am using. And uh, the first step is reading some TF records. So we are using the read from TF record here. Uh, that takes uh, a, a, uh, the, the file location. Um, it's going to process uh, the TF records, extract the serialized strings, and pass them onto run inference. And the only configuration I need to give to run inference is to tell it it's running in local mode. And this is the um, uh, where the model is stored, which is stored on a bucket in, in Google Cloud Storage. Finally, we do a print. So let me uh, run this. OK, so that's been run, and we have our output, which is a prediction log. When you print the prediction log, it's just going to print it out as JSON. And we see here that uh, the request that was sent in, this is the serialized string that was sent in. Sadly, my brain is not able to understand what that is, um, but we'll come to that uh, in a moment. And the response is 100. So 
hopefully if I remember my five times table, my guess is this string value was 20. Um, and this is the response that the model has. Now, thinking about, you know, in a production environment, you're not going to just use the prediction log and print it. You want to extract the information from the prediction log and make it available for the next stages of your pipeline. So I'm going to skip past the rest of uh, this output and get to uh, the next pipeline. So in this next pipeline, we add one more step, which is post-processing. And what we're doing in the post-processing is this prediction processor. Again, it's a do fun. And this do fun takes in as an element a prediction log. Now, the prediction log, we then parse out information from that prediction log. For example, we pass out the input, that string, but we convert it into something that I can read. And we also pass out the output. For the purpose of the demo, we then yield a nice pretty line uh, for us to be able to see in the print statement. And that do fun is simply added uh, to the, the graph. So run inference. Um, next step is prediction processor. So now let's run this. Great. So now we have our input, which was 20, and the uh, what our little learner model was expecting as output. Uh, going back to uh, our slides now. So one thing that we did there was um, we had our data point, so the number 20, for example. We ran it through the model, and at the other end, we got our data point and our prediction. As we mentioned earlier, though, in production environments, you'll tend to have metadata associated with that data point. So, for example, you might have an IOD, uh, an ID from an IoT device or an image name, et cetera. So how do we pass that? Well, um, if you're using TensorFlow Raw, you could actually do some things with the signature to actually have a, a bit of metadata that gets passed through and doesn't get called in model. There's all that kind of stuff you could do. But run inference actually has this built in. And basically, all we need to do is pass it the key value pair. And run inference takes care of doing the processing and giving us a return result which includes the key. In fact, run inference has got quite a few method signatures, uh, and, and I've selected some of them here. Um, so given a P collection of bytes, we are outputting a prediction log, very similar to the first thing that we did. But given a tuple of key values, so key bytes, we're going to get the key prediction log out. Again, this is all niceties around the, uh, the, uh, the, the API, which makes it very easy uh, to work with. Um, so let's go back to our notebook. I'm going to go to the next stage. Now, to make this uh, uh, more interesting still, we're going to actually use a different source rather than some raw TF record files. We're actually going to use some information which has been stored in BigQuery, Google's data warehouse in the cloud. Um, and for that, i am created a table within BigQuery which has two columns. The first column is our key. So we're going to do a pop quiz for our little uh, learner model. Um, first question, second question, third question, along with the question itself. Um, and actually, the questions are outside of the domain of data that the model learned from, because we only went up to 100 when we taught it. So it's not going to do as well, but it's it's uh, 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 this would be interesting. All right, so this is going to be loaded into BigQuery. Now we will look at our pipeline and how that changes things. So going down to this bottom piece of code, so this is our pipeline. <laughs> Um, we have now changed uh, from TensorFlow Records to BigQuery as a source. We're passing in the table that contains this information. That's going to give us a set of table row objects that we will then need to parse. Um, in the next step, I do a map. So now I'm doing pre-processing of raw data. I am extracting the key, which is that question. Um, and I am doing some processing to create serialized TF examples ready for the model. Next step no changes. So the rest of the code remains exactly as the, the same. So now I'm going to run this. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Um, the next step in terms of prediction with key. So apologies. So we do make some changes to the prediction with key processor. So the post processing does change because rather than just having a value, we now have a key. So the prediction with key processor um, now takes a tuple uh, of bytes prediction log. So this is the output of run inference because it's passed the key through. And then we do the, the, some similar extractions to get a nice, pretty output. Uh, I'm going to run this. Now, this will take a little bit longer than the previous one uh, because it's now going to BigQuery, pulling the information, getting that ready, pulling the model, and uh, outputting it. So there we go. It's done, done that work. Here we can see the key is fourth question. Uh, the input was 1,013. And this is uh, the output that we have. So our little learner model passes its, its, its first little test. Um, so one interesting thing about uh, the flow so far 
is that um, we is, it's pretty serial. So we have input that we pre-process and got ready. We run the inference, and then we have output. That's that's all we've done. We're not yet making use of the full capabilities of having a graph at our disposable disposal to do some really interesting multi-model uh, uh, predictions. Um, and with that, we'll just go back to Robert to describe uh, one of those use cases and why it's useful in the ML world. Thanks, Reza. Uh, so one of the things that, that people often do with models and actually in other domains as well, um, is that they'll, they'll do live experimentation to, to try to find which of several models performs best. And what I mean by perform best here is that the model metrics, the things you use to train your model and optimize it are usually not exact matches for your business objectives. Um, so for example, if you're doing a recommender system, you're gonna probably train your model on clicks uh, but businesses really want to maximize profit. That's that's the real goal. And different products have different profit margins. So all clicks are not created equal. And so the question for the business is, which of these models actually gets me better profits? So what they'll do is uh, an A-B testing situation where they'll set up the model. They'll uh, use a load balancer to divert part of the, of the incoming request to one model or another and they'll measure the business results from the different models. And based on that, they'll, they'll make a choice of which model they actually want to uh, promote to, you know, sort of the, the full-time production model. Um, so they're gonna gather results from that. So um, that is, uh, in, in this case, uh, since we're doing linear models, uh, it's, you know, a fairly simple situation where we have two models here and. Uh, we have some sort of business goals, uh, and uh, we're going to compare the results of these two models. And with that, um, I'll go back to Reza. Yep. Thanks, uh, uh, Robert. So uh, for us to have two models to work with, now normally, like if you're doing A-B testing, there would be not that much different between the models. But to make it very clear here, uh, we trained a second model with a completely different set of data. So. Uh, in that model, it's a function uh, which is the 10 times table. Uh, so the data that it was trained on is 10x. So given uh, a number of five, for example, it will output 50. So these are two very different models, but it will serve for our demonstration purposes. And in terms of uh, what we're doing, well, it's actually very trivial to set this up in the environment we've already got. All we need to do is, given the raw data and the pre-processing that we've done, apply multiple times all the models that we would like to train against that data, uh, sorry, to infer uh, against that data. So model A and model B just become branches in our pipeline. And for uh, those of you who are already familiar with Beam, you'll know that that's actually a very straightforward thing to do. Um, this is the pipeline that uh, we are constructing. So um, we have our questions. So now we have, uh, uh, I'm, I'm creating a P collection instead of just chaining everything together. So we now have a, 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 a P collection of questions which is the output from the uh, reading BigQuery. We are then um, uh, uh, applying uh, processing to the questions. So um, uh, the questions P collection is shown twice here and here. So to that P collection, we first apply multiply by five. We do our pre-processing. We're actually putting in some indicators here to tell us afterwards where this came from. And after that, it's running inference. This gives us a P collection of uh, inferred results when using the uh, five times time table model. And we'd repeat the same process for the 10 times model. So now we have a branch in our pipeline. We uh, have two collections that we want to um, look into. So multiply five and multiply 10. I Because these are all uh, containing the same object, I send them to a beam flatten. All this does is given that tuple, it turns it into a single P collection which then runs through the rest of our processing. So um, let's run this now. And uh, hopefully in a moment we will uh, get our results. Again, this is reading from BigQuery, uh, doing all the processing and running it against both those models. There we are. Um, so here we see the output from those two different uh, uh, runs. So if we look at the first question, times y5 gives us 525. Uh, the first question when it was done against 10 model gives us 1053. So here you can see that with very simple code, um, we were able to actually do multiple models uh, against the same data set 
uh, in, in, in the uh, Beam pipeline. Okay, next, um, we're going to do a slightly different model, uh, which allows us to do models in sequence. And for that, I'm going to hand over back to uh, Robert. Uh, Robert, I've got the slides to tell me when to uh, switch as you need. Sure. Uh, thanks, Reza. So um, you can work with, with multiple models in different ways. A common way in machine learning is to use what's called a cascade ensemble which basically just means that you're going to take the output from one model and feed it into another model. So uh, in this case, you might have a language understanding model, like, like a, a BERT model, for example, and, and feed that uh, output into a product recommender. So that's, that's a basic cascade ensemble. But given that, that pattern, you can do some pretty interesting things. So here, here's a more complex example where we, we might be taking um, input from customers where they're either on the phone and we're getting voice or they're chatting with us, uh, you know, maybe in a chat bot and, or, or we're reading emails. So we can have a speech to text model if they're, if they're on the phone or just feed the text directly into a language understanding model and do sentiment analysis and save that off whether they're, they're happy or, or angry into a customer service log, and then try to answer the, the, the customer's inquiry with a product recommender or a support recommender, depending upon what it is that they're asking about. And if they're on the phone, we're, we're gonna wanna reply in speech, so we're gonna use text-to-speech. So this is you know, just, a, just one example of, of uh, really a DAG that you could uh, use to, to uh, Put together models, and you can think of these as transforming data. They're they're in a way transforming voice into you know a voice response or or text into a text response. Um, but we're using models, these incredibly powerful transformations, to do that. And with that, I'll turn it back to Reza. Thank you, Robert. So um, again, like that's a very powerful uh, system. An application, a set of transformations, as Rob describes them. Um, in terms of the code that we need to do at the data engineering side, is actually very trivial. All we do now is we take our raw data, we do our pre-processing, get, get our key and, and value ready, send it to run inference, and the output of that model is a P collection that we then pass into the next model. Um, so let's go to uh, the, the Beam pipeline to do this. And here we see, um, again, very uh, straightforward path. Um, we have our questions that we had from BigQuery. Our questions have the multiply five um, uh, run inference run against them. So this is pretty similar to what we were doing previously in the A-B testing. So now we have a P collection multiply. So this is the values that have been multiplied by five. Next, we do a little bit of post-processing um, which is to take the multiply P collection. And I won't go into the details of this, but what this does is it extracts the right information and gets things ready to run through run inference again. I also do this um, uh, little technique here where I take some information from the, the, uh, uh, the output of the, the multiply and you put that into the key for the next stage. The reason I do that is so that when we get some printed output, it, it actually shows the lineage all the way from, from the top. Um, and then after that, everything is pretty straightforward. We are running the, the same post-processing uh, and printing that we did before. So let me run this. And this will go off to BigQuery, get its data, um, pull the model in, and run both of the, 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 the models uh, sequentially for our output. And here we have our output. We can see the first question. The input was 105. So this was the original at the top, and I used that key passing technique with a little bit of added metadata to, to make this possible. Um, and the input, uh, that outputs 525. And uh, and that's some bad phrasing. I should put input output from first layer, uh, from first uh, uh, transform. And then that 525 is fed to the next model where our little learner model uh, multiplies it by 10 and gets, our, our, gets this result, which is close enough. So here you can see that with actually very little code, we were able to compose a fairly sophisticated system uh, to uh, uh, do processing. Now, the model we're using here is trivial, but this model could be one of those very complex models that 
that um, does pretty powerful transformations that, that Robert mentioned. Um, uh, very quickly at the end of this, uh, just wanted to cover one of the common things around inference when the models get larger and more sophisticated is uh, the requirement to have GPUs uh, uh, do the work. Um, and uh, uh, essentially what we'd like is in certain stages, so that the, in this particular case, run inference, we may want to actually put some operations on a GPU. So GPUs have become available with uh, Dataflow very recently. Um, just by setting an optional parameter, you can actually pass in uh, so that the workers will have uh, an NVIDIA GPU available for processing. In terms of the architecture, so uh, there's a container image that runs on the workers. That contains the NVIDIA CUDA libraries, et cetera. That allows the transformation to communicate to the GPUs. And the nice thing about run inference is if the model's set up to make use of GPUs, uh, there, there may be, depending on your model, some, some extra work there. Um, then uh, the, the run inference, because the GPUs are available, will automatically uh, make use of, of those uh, GPUs for us. Um, and uh, with that, uh, just wanted to pass. I think we have a few more minutes for questions.